Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence, for your Holy Spirit, and for the opportunity to come in freedom and worship you. Be with us today, I pray, in a very special way, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, before I get started, um, this is that weekend, yes, 4th of July weekend, so I want to ask if there are any men in our crowd, I uh, did not go in the service. I had a brother who went in the service, but they came out with the lottery, and I didn't have to go. And I praise God for that. But, um, but for those who did, um, I would like for you to stand right now, those who served in the military, if we have any here today. Do we have any here? None whatsoever that served in the military. Okay, that's interesting. That really is. Um, but we definitely want to recognize the fact that our freedoms can be taken away at any time. In fact, many of our freedoms have already been taken away. And uh, we know that uh, there will be many more taken away before uh, the end of time. I'm going to share just a little uh, story with you. I, th I just thought about it as I was sitting there going over the details this morning, and it came to my mind, and uh, I don't want to hear any laughter out of anybody now. If I do, I'm, if, if I do I'm coming down there, I'm telling you right now. But I looked it up online, and sure enough, in 1955, was our, the centennial year for the town of Aledo, Illinois. A-L-E-D-O, Aledo, Illinois. That's where I was born. And I, I looked it up, and June 22 of 1955, I guess, was when they had their centennial parade. Well, my parents, my mom especially, dressed me up. I was not quite five. I would turn five in August. So I was, I was right close, almost five. She dressed me up in this real colorful outfit, put one of these light top hats on me, and we had a monkey. His name was Jocko. He was a ringtail monkey. And I was big on riding my tricycle. So they decorated my tricycle up to match my outfit that I had on. And the monkey was dressed just like me. I said, no laughing. And so I went through the parade on my tricycle, pulling the wagon behind with the monkey in it. Now, he wouldn't keep his hat on. Wouldn't keep his hat on. But this little story just goes to show you that there is a prize that we all are reaching for. Well, I didn't know it at the time. I had no clue. I wasn't even five years old quite. But at the end of that parade, when it was over, I discovered I had won first prize in my whatever it was they, they had. My, you know, my category. I had won first prize, and I got a silver dollar. A silver dollar. Now, we're going to be talking about the imperishable crown today, but there's a perishable crown. And that prize that I got that day, like Flo mentioned to me when I told her the story, she said, I'm sure that silver dollar was gone within probably an hour or two. Well, it was, and I kept it for a few days, but it was nice to be able to spend that. In 1955, silver dollar gets you quite a bit of stuff. So anyway, but we reach for a prize that's perishable many times, and that's what that was. The only thing I have is memories of it, and I think if I looked really hard, I could probably even find a picture of, of me pulling the wagon, but, but we want to reach for an imperishable crown. That's what we're going to talk about today. And before we begin, let's bow our heads again.
Father in heaven, make me that nail upon the wall. Fasten securely in its place. And upon that nail hang a picture of thy dear face. In Jesus' name, amen. I went to the dentist to get my six-month usual cleaning. And I've only had a couple cavities in my life. And, uh, you know, I'm not 30 anymore. So, I mean, you know, people would expect that probably. But I got there, and I had been noticing over here on the side that it felt a little strange. Well, they took x-ray and discovered that that tooth on the side there was, was bad. It's the one clear up on the left-hand side. And so they come to me and said, we are going to have to put a crown on your tooth. Well, I've never had a crown before. So now I can give this sermon with full assurance and let you know that I now have a crown. I have a crown, and it's the permanent one. They gave me a temporary one for a couple weeks, but it's the permanent one. So what is the purpose of a crown? Crowns are used to protect, cover, restore, and shape your teeth when fillings don't solve the problem. That's what that crown's for. But we're not here to talk about that kind of a crown. We're here to talk about an incorruptible crown, also known as an imperishable crown. And it's referenced there in 1 Corinthians uh, 9 and 25. And that was written by Paul, and he deems that this crown, this imperishable, in order to contrast it with the temporal awards, Paul's Contemporaries, they pursued that type of a crown. He talked about the race that they ran. And it's therefore given to those individuals who demonstrate the imperishable crown. To those individuals who demonstrate self-denial and perseverance. And perseverance. And then there's a crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness, it's mentioned in 2 Timothy 4.8. And it's promised to those who love and anticipate the second coming of Christ. These Christians desire an intimacy with God. I don't know about you, but I want to have an intimacy with God. So, as I was walking down the hallway, a thought came into my mind that I knew I had heard before. It came out of nowhere, and it said in my mind that no one may take your crown. So, sometimes when words or something comes into my mind, I'll get in the concordance and I'll look it up and I'll find the verse that goes along with that word so that I can see what the context of that is. And when the Lord speaks to us, he usually speaks in a specific phrase or scripture that can be found, you know. So as I dove into scripture... I saw that the Lord had something pressing and clear that he wanted not only to speak to me, but to you, the church. The phrase comes from Revelation 3, chapter 3, verse 11. It says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. 
I hadn't really thought about somebody taking my crown. But do you believe that Jesus speaks to the local church? That he has specific words in season for a particular group of people? I believe he does. And this is for everyone who is part of this church. My immediate question then from the scriptures is this. What is your crown? And how can someone take it from you? First, what is our crown? Well, I believe there are five Five things that this crown represents and will give us insight into how to hold fast what we have. The crown given to believers in Jesus represents these five things, position, perseverance, power, prize, and people. First of all, hopefully, these five words will help each one of us to remember what our crown is and equip us to run this race, casting off every hindrance that would be laid in front of you as a trap. Did you know that there are traps laid in front of you? It's true. Today, I believe that God wants to uncover traps that have been set for you. That you can see them clearly and that you can avoid them and walk straight ahead into the calling that he has for each and every one of us. So first of all is position. Holy and righteous. By position I mean your position in Christ. Your position is holy and righteous. Your position is what you have received in Christ and stand in him. You want to be totally secure in him and in the understanding of your position in Christ to be able to stand against the trickery of men and of the devil. So holiness and righteousness, they're not something that you work for, but they're something that is given to you in Christ. We have a shadow, a picture of this gift of holiness in the Old Covenant. The first crown in the scripture is the crown of holiness, and we see it in the priestly crown made of pure gold. It was placed on Aaron's, on Aaron's head, who was the high priest. It's found in Exodus 39, verse 30. It says, Then they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote on it an inscription like the engraving of a signet. And it said on it, engraved, holiness to the Lord. And in Exodus 28, verse 38, it says, So it shall be on Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hallow in all their holy gifts, and it shall always be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. So over the head of the high priest were the words, holiness to the Lord. It means to be set apart for God and to God, separated consecrated to God and to the ministry of reconciling men to God. So the priest then was set apart for the ministry of the temple. And in the old covenant, 
the only one who was allowed to wear the crown was the priest. The crown of holiness. But, but now, but now, today, in Christ, you have received the full promise and privilege of holiness to the Lord. And the scripture says that he has made us priests and kings. This banner is enshrined over your head, giving you full and free access to the holy of holies, that we may have boldness to enter in and approach his throne, that we may enter the cloud and the fire. As Cynthia prayed this morning, she took us directly to the throne, to the throne room in heaven. In fact, the holy of holies, it comes to dwell inside of us so that our very identity becomes this. It becomes holy. Did you know that the word saint in the New Testament, in the New Testament, is the exact same Greek word as holy. That is your name. We're saints. You've been set apart as his own people. Your position in Christ is holiness to the Lord. So go boldly before his throne and stand in the gap for your brothers and your sisters as we did this morning praying for those standing in the gap. And for those that have yet to come into the kingdom, we are a priest to God. Not only is our position holiness to the Lord, but our position is righteous. Holiness means that you have been set apart for God totally other than the world. Totally other than the world. We aren't to be of the world, even though we live in the world. And righteous means that you've been made flawless in the eyes of God. And God will not count your sins and failures against you, but only sees the perfect obedience of Jesus when he looks at you. That's an awesome thought to think about. His blood covers us to a point where God only sees Jesus. 2 Timothy 4.8, finally there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now let me make it clear. Before I'm misunderstood, no one can take your holiness or your righteousness away from you as though someone could steal your salvation. But you can allow someone to deceive you into believing a lie about what you've been given in Jesus. And then you can begin to live in a manner that denies the very gift that you've been given. There are so many like that. Who they can get in the scriptures and study it. And then in just a few days fall away. In Galatians 1. This is what happened there. In verses 6 through 8. Paul writing to the Galatians says. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. 
that even if we, or an angel, even if we, talk, Paul talking about him and those with him, or even an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And then in 3, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? Or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? We have to live in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Do not assume that you are not being continually lied to by voices and people at every turn. Some ignorant and some by deceitful plotting. Trying to lure you away from Christ to try to make you put confidence in your own abilities. For you to put confidence in man-made solutions as opposed to the life of Christ dwelling in you. And you say, oh no, that could never happen to me. That would never happen to me. And I hope that is the case for each and every one of us. Don't be moved away from the simplicity and sufficiency of Jesus for your joy, for your favor, for your righteousness, for your peace of mind. There is no peace of mind like the mind of Christ. We talked a little bit about that in Sabbath school this morning. Secondly is perseverance. The crown is given to those who persevere. Perseverance is also a gift given to the elect to be able to withstand and press through difficulties and trials and all forms of opposition and yet not deny Christ and not turn away. If it were up to you to persevere, you wouldn't. We talked about that this morning also. The trials. These trials are brought upon us, though, to purge us and to make the gold pure. But just because perseverance is a gift, it doesn't, does not prevent Jesus from commanding us to persevere. We can persevere only because Jesus did what? He persevered. The first crown in the New Testament is that crown of thorns. That crown of thorns. It's the crown that Jesus had to persevere. And to get to the crown of glory, he went through that crown of thorns. Suffering is going to come before the glory. In Matthew 27, verse 29, it says, When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they beat him on the head with that reed. In this life, Christ endured a crown of thorns that we can receive a crown of glory. Hopefully we don't have to. 
wear that crown of thorns ever. In fact, in everything, Jesus really led the way. He came as a servant. He died in shame that he might reign in glory and all authority. If Jesus endured such hostility, can he not sustain us through trials and insults and pressures on all sides? Being delivered to death at every turn? Have we forgotten Paul's desire to fellowship in Christ's sufferings? How is it? How is it that we as Americans hate all forms of suffering? We do. You know, we run and protect ourselves from pain. Give me something for the pain. Any trial, any difficulty, as though eliminating those difficult times is a mark of spirituality. In other words, we shouldn't go through those. If we're spiritual people, we shouldn't have to suffer those. I'm guilty. In Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. 2 Timothy 1.8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Now we know Paul suffered a lot. He was stoned basically to death at one time, beaten almost to death three times, shipwrecked, bit by a serpent, he endured many things. In Colossians 1, 24, I now rejoice, Paul writing, in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. You see, eliminating difficulty from our life is not the goal or purpose, really, of the Christian. Fellowshipping with Christ and his suffering is actually a privilege, as we studied this morning. That I believe many American Christians fail to receive because they're running from all forms of difficulty. When we hear those stories about those missionaries in the foreign lands who were persecuted for spreading the gospel. We don't know what that's really like. But it's the crown of thorns before the glory. In Hebrews 2 and verse 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So are we greater than our master? Are we more important than Jesus? Are we owed greatness and glory on this earth? Some of us may think so. I don't mean that we should aim our lives to grovel in the dirt and purposefully try to suffer and grit our teeth through it for the glory of God. But we can rejoice in suffering. We can. We can be confident that all suffering is working in us a sweet fellowship with Jesus if we allow patience to have its work in us. In James 5, verses 10 and 11, my brethren take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. 
You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Yes, he actually doubled Job's blessing at the end. Don't set aside the crown of perseverance because of trials and suffering. Thirdly is power. Ruling authority. By power, I mean the governmental ruling authority that God gives his children to administer the kingdom of God. The crown also represents this authority that every believer is called to walk in. And he has made us, as I said before, priests and kings. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Don't miss out on that part in verse 19 where it says, I'm sorry, in verse 20 where it says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Baptism is a wonderful thing, but a change needs to take place. Jesus calls us to walk and demonstrate his authority in the earth. And Satan is always opposing the church, trying to convince the church that it has no authority and trick us into believing lies. The authority that Jesus has, he gives that to you and to me. And the main tactic of Satan is to pressure you into a position of silence. Do we see that? It's like we as Christians today, if we say anything, it's like we're, we're saying hate words now. You're almost afraid to know what to say. But that's his tactic. We can overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. What is your testimony? Do you share that testimony? A living testimony of proclaiming the faithfulness and goodness of God. Have you seen him in your life? Has he done anything for you? Has he been there for you? Has he performed miracles for you? Yes. Praise God for that. Don't let any man, don't let any man Take your crown by silencing you from proclaiming the testimony of God. Let no man trick you into thinking that some human means will give you authority. Authority comes from submitting to authority. And Satan and his minions will try to convince you that authority comes from challenging God-given authority. No, it doesn't. In the garden, Satan stole man's authority, convincing him of a lie that exaltation could be achieved by going around God's authoritative command. Jesus, you don't have to do this. These people don't really love you. They don't care. Don't do it. You don't have to go through this for them. They really don't love you and care. Why put yourself through it? Satan was there and his minions whispering in Jesus' head, putting those thoughts there. Does he put those thoughts in your head? Shake them off 
and listen to the Holy Spirit speak to you. I could say much more on power, but our time isn't so that I can. So let's move on to four, the prize. The honor and reward of faithfulness to Christ. There's a great reward to those who follow Christ to the end. God is delighted to place honor on his beloved. Those who hold fast his testimony through every difficulty. It's not going to be easy. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Really? Temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. But we for what? An imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body. And bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul goes as far as to compare the race of faith to that of a competition for a prize. And that thinking, it's not wrong. So what is Paul competing for? The context is that Paul is competing to fulfill his call to preach the gospel willingly that he might win as many to Christ as he possibly can. Is that your goal? The imperishable crown, it's a reward of faithfulness to the person of Christ and faithful to the calling of his that he has placed upon your life. Don't sell your calling to someone else. You know, God's giving you a mandate in this life that you can pass off onto someone else. There's a great reward in being faithful with what you have been given. You can't be faithful with someone else's calling. You can only be faithful with your own calling. You can allow someone to take this crown of reward by moving away from connection to Christ. You can't allow that to happen. But God forbid, the head by placing your faith in anything other than Christ himself for your joy, happiness, peace, provision, satisfaction, healing, and source of life. Don't let it, anybody take that away. In Colossians 2, 8 through 10, beware, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. He is the head. In verse 18, let no one cheat you of your reward. Taking delight in false humility and worship of angels. Intruding into those things which he has not seen vainly puffed up by his flesh, fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head or Christ from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with an increase that is from God. Let no one cheat you of your reward. Verse 18. And lastly, number five people. Finally, we come to the last, but certainly not the least. Represent, representation of the crown. The crown is the people of God that God has placed you in relationship with, within the body of Christ, to be accountable for the benefit and growth of their faith. God has placed every believer 
in a local body of Christ to which they are responsible to love and build up the faith of those fellow believers. That's why you're here today. That's what we're here for. In Philippians, Paul calls the believers themselves his crown. Philippians 4.1, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. 1 Thessalonians 2.19, he says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? What do I want more than anything else as I stand up here is for each one of you to be seen there waiting for the Lord when he comes in the clouds of glory? Yes. To Paul, the believers that were in connection with him, those whom he was leading and influencing and fellowshipping with, they were his crown, not prizes of money or of fame, but people. People, your people, brought into the presence of God at the Lord's coming. People are a prize worth competing for. Yes, they are. Do you love your neighbor as yourself? A prize worth sacrificing for, worth fighting for. A prize worth disciplining your life to make yourself as useful as possible to the Lord for. Don't let yourself get to a point where you feel useless. God wants to use us, whatever that case may be. If all you can do is pray, you can at least do that. How can you allow someone to take your crown? How can you allow someone to take your crown by allowing people to sow division in your heart toward the body of Christ by listening and allowing gossip and slander toward other believers and toward the leaders of the church by allowing division and offense to fester. You can allow your connection and responsibility to love and build up your brothers and sisters to be cut off. Build each other up. There's a text that says we should put always our brother above ourselves and think more of them than we do ourselves. Do you look at your brothers and sisters in the local body of Christ here in the church as your crown of glory? Think about it. They can be your crown of glory. Are you holding fast to what you've been given in Christ? So with all that we've seen of what our crown represents, position, perseverance, power, pride, and people, I want to read now the context of our first verse that was Revelation 3, verse 11. The faithful church, the church of Philadelphia, just before the Laodicean church, it was called the church of brotherly love. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, verse 7 and onward, these things, says he, who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it for you have a little strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before you, before your feet, and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my commands to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the world, the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. He will be our protection and our buckler. He who overcomes, I will make him pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. That means he will live with him forever. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, and the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name, 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This was Jesus speaking to through John, to John, the revelator. Are you holding fast to what you've been given in Christ? Are you abiding in your position as holy and righteous? Are you persevering through trials without reversing your testimony? Keep that testimony. Are you walking in the power and authority that God has called you to, not being silenced by pressure or control? Are you connected to the head, Christ? Or have you been lured away to put confidence in anything else but Christ? God forbid. Are you contending for the unity of the body of Christ, holding the people of God as your crown, and fighting, fighting for your faith? It's my prayer today that each one of us will long for and want that imperishable crown, that crown of righteousness, that crown of holiness, that crown that Jesus will place on our heads when we reach that glorious city, the new Jerusalem. That's my prayer for you today. And if that's your prayer, I pray that you will stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, our closing hymn, Draw Me Nearer, number 306, Draw Me Nearer, as Ron leads us.
potluck. Um, our offering next week goes to the world budget. And also there is Vacation Bible School registration on Sunday, July the 24th at 5.30 to 7.30. And can someone tell me if it's going to be here or at the first church? First church, okay. At the first church, which is Delta Street. And then the Vacation Bible School will be held Monday through Friday, and then the graduation will be Sabbath, July the 30th. And they recommend children of ages 5 to 12 years old. Also, First Church is having their revival, um, Why God Truly Loves You, by Pastor Donald Monroe. And it's this week, Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, Friday night at 6 o'clock, and then Saturday morning at 11. And the Franklin County Give a, a Kid a Chance needs some school supplies, so we're going to be collecting pencils, crayons, and glue, or um, donations this week only. So we'll be taking those up this coming next Sabbath on July 9th as well. And then the Telehoma School is going to be having a kindergarten class uh, starting soon. If anyone needs more information, there's a phone number on the back of your bulletin for that. Thanks, Valerie.